If you look at any scientific news publication from the last 10 years, you're almost guaranteed to see at least one article on quantum computers. You'll usually hear about superposition and entanglement, which I'll talk about in another video. The articles will say that it's because of these two things that quantum computers will beat out classical computers at solving some types of problems. The reason quantum computers can have an edge over classical computers is the way in which they solve problems. Classical computers tackle problems iteratively, meaning they explore solutions one at a time. Even when they're programmed by clever computer programmers who can find ways to speed up algorithms, at the end of the day, the classical computer still tests each solution one by one until it finds the right answer. Quantum computers, on the other hand, solve problems in a completely different way, by going down all possible solution paths at the same time. A good analogy, although an incomplete one, is to imagine you're trying to solve a maze. The way classical computers work is the way you would usually go about solving a maze. You try each possible path, marking it down on a map. If you don't make it out, you head back and try another path, trying each one until you find the path out. Quantum computers approach a problem like this in a very different way. Imagine you had a hose and could fill the maze up with water. If you could fill the maze fast enough, water would flood the entire maze and start flowing out the exit. If you follow the current, once the maze is filled up, it'll lead you out. In a sense, the water has tried all possible paths of the maze, but the current flowing in a specific direction has selected the path for you. This is kind of like what quantum computers do. While this analogy isn't perfect, and I'll explain why it's not perfect later, it's a decent picture as a starting point. Now, let's get into some physics. Quantum mechanics is a scientific theory that helps us understand how tiny particles like atoms and subatomic particles behave. It also explains how we can use superposition and entanglement. Since we make our qubits out of quantum systems, like neutral atoms, trapped ions, or superconducting circuits, we can use quantum mechanics to describe them. Let's do a quick refresher on qubits. Qubits are quantum systems with two distinct states. In the realm of quantum mechanics, physicists define a system as anything we wish to analyze with mathematical equations, and a state as a precise description of a system's properties, like its position, momentum, and spin. For simplicity's sake, to keep the math manageable, we often assume that these systems don't interact with their surroundings. However, to make this assumption work in reality, we have to invest a lot of effort into shielding these systems from external influences. Often, this involves surrounding our samples with metal cages to protect them from stray electric and magnetic fields, cooling them down to near-absolute zero temperatures, and many other things. Like I said, qubits require a quantum system with two states. When we solve the Schrodinger equation, which is the fundamental equation in quantum mechanics for determining energy states in quantum systems, it's common for the actual system at hand to have more than just two states. Usually, in fact, there are an infinite number of states that our system could be in. In such scenarios, our usual approach is to consider the lowest two energy states, because these states are the most convenient to manipulate in the lab. Once we've established our two-level system, we can designate one state as zero and the other as one, providing a clear starting point for our computations. Unlike classical bits, which are confined to only be in the zero or one state, qubits possess a unique quality. They can exist in a superposition of zero and one simultaneously. A superposition state is a state whereby our qubit carries a certain probability of being measured to be in either state, but the actual outcome remains uncertain until we make a measurement. Importantly, this isn't just information we don't know. The qubit really is in a combination of both states until we measure. This contrasts with classical computers, which lack an equivalent concept. You can't divide a classical bit into being half zero and half one. It's fundamentally either switched on or off. Take this scenario, a single qubit and an even mix of the zero and one states, giving a 50% chance to each. You can find the probabilities of getting each state by squaring the numbers in front of each state. Again, classical computers don't have this twist. They're either all in zero or all in one. Putting a qubit in this specific 50-50 superposition from the zero state is actually so useful that the act of making this superposition from the zero state has a name called the Hadamard transformation. In quantum computing, we often call transformations gates, so the transformation is also known as the Hadamard gate. All right, so now that we've covered states and superposition, let's see how this helps us solve problems faster. To get there, let's see how classical computers tackle problems first. Like I said before, classical computers follow algorithms that require iterative processes. Often, at a first pass, this involves systematically testing solutions one by one until the correct one is found. This approach is often referred to as the brute force method. 
While sensible, this method is usually not the most efficient, because you end up wasting time considering the answers that are obviously incorrect for some reason. As an alternative to the brute force method, we can brainstorm clever algorithms to speed things up for classical computers. But at the end of the day, there are still many problems that require a lot of iteration to solve, even with a clever algorithm. Here's a quick example. Imagine you want to find a friend's number in a phone book, but your jerk dog ripped the entire book apart so that only fragments of it are strewn about. None of the pages are completely destroyed, so you know that if you look long enough, you'll find it. The brute force method of finding your friend's phone number would be to individually look through every single name in the book until you find their name. Here, there are two iterations. First, you iterate through all the pages, and on each page you iterate through every name on that page. A smarter algorithm that improves upon this would be to look at the first and last name on each page and see if your friend's initials would fall into the range on that page, since pages are alphabetized. If they do, then they're on that page. If not, you can immediately discard it, and that saves the second iteration, meaning going through all the names on that page. In this way you would save a lot of time, but you'd still have to iterate through all the pages. If we switch to quantum computing, superposition lets us skip the line in certain cases. The name of the game is spotting problems and designing algorithms that put our quantum computer in a state where it explores all possible answers together, like our example of water flowing through a maze. It takes in everything, both right and wrong answers, but there's more. Here's where superposition becomes gold. If we can get our quantum computer into a state that's a superposition of all the answers at once and find a clever algorithm to modify the probabilities in our superposition, then the job is done. We just need an algorithm that guides the probability to the right answer. I'll break down these specific algorithms in the future, but for this video I'm just going to outline a general process. Before I do that though, here's a snag. Remember I mentioned the water analogy isn't flawless? Well, here's why. In the water analogy, water explores all the paths and reliably finds the right one due to physics. The current will always show the right answer to the maze every single time. However, in quantum computing there's always a chance of hitting the wrong answer. The hitch lies in actually measuring the superposition of the system. When you measure, the superposition collapses, leaving just one answer. Nobody really knows why the superposition collapses, there are many different interpretations of quantum mechanics and each pose a possibility. But for now, we can use the fact that we know this happens to do computation. The probabilities of measuring each answer stem from the superposition's coefficients. Think about it this way. Our quantum algorithms spread probabilities among states. If all states begin equally likely, a smart algorithm can nudge the probabilities towards the correct answer, even if we're unsure of what the answer is ourselves. The way each algorithm does this varies based on the type of problem you're trying to solve. Since probabilities must total 1, they're shuffled among states, though not entirely. This leads to a scenario where a quantum computer can be wrong sometimes, even when executing an algorithm perfectly. So does this make quantum computers weak? Well, not so fast. To rescue our accuracy, we can just run the algorithm multiple times, and go with the answer that appears most frequently. In fact, if you're using IBM's quantum computers right now, you'll see the shots count. This indicates how many times they've run your algorithm to build a probability spread. It's usually over a thousand times. Let's walk through a general example to get a feel for how things work. In this video, like I said, I won't dive into a specific algorithm, so we won't be cracking a particular problem. However, we'll go through a basic process that a quantum computer follows. First up, we actually need a quantum computer, so let's take this IBM 5 qubit quantum computer as our model. A quantum computer houses numerous qubits, each of which are capable of being put into a superposition or entangled with others. For the case of many quantum algorithms, the way we tap into the water-like property of our quantum computers is by applying a Walsh-Hadamard transform. This is just a fancy way of saying that we put every single qubit into an equal superposition of 0 and 1, meaning that we apply a Hadamard transformation to every qubit on our quantum computer. But why do we do this? Well, remember, our goal is to start our algorithm with an equal superposition of every possible answer, just like how the water starts going down every single possible path. Each 5-bit long string of 1s and zeros here is a possible answer. We just need an algorithm to find which answer is the correct one depending on the specific problem. Applying the walsh hadamard transform is the step that puts us into the superposition of all possible answers, so that our algorithm can take it from there and move around the probabilities. Now, if we write out our total superposition of all of our qubits, here's what it looks like. Here, in our superposition, all possible answers to our unspecified problem have 5 qubits. Because we're using a 5 qubit quantum computer, they're written as sets of 5 numbers, a mix of 1s and zeros in brackets. Basically, 
Every single possible way of arranging five ones or zeros is in here. For our five qubit system, that's two to the five or 32 possibilities. But don't sweat it. When we write code for a quantum computer, we don't actually write out these long strings. I'm just showing you what's happening inside the quantum computer under the hood. Now we just apply our algorithm. The algorithm takes the initial superposition that we inputted and modulates the probabilities to favor the answer we want. And the cool part? Just like classical computers, we can design these algorithms so that we don't need to know the answer in advance. For example, in our phone book case, we know what the answer should look like, i.e. that it should be our friend's name next to a phone number, but we don't know what the phone number is, that's why we're looking in the first place. In other words, we just need to understand the math moves to make, and our quantum computer does all the heavy lifting in terms of the actual computation, just like classical computers. Once we've run our algorithm, we can then measure our qubits. Remember, when we measure the qubits, we destroy the superposition, so we only get one answer out. It's one of those 32 possibilities, and it could be the wrong one. So, we then repeat this entire process over and over again until we have enough shots to make a probability distribution. At that point, we stop the algorithm and confidently declare that we very likely nailed the answer as the state that was measured with the highest probability. It's important that I mention that what I have described here is just one way quantum computers can work. Not all quantum algorithms use this walsh hadamard transform to explore all the possible states at the same time, but this is one of the more common techniques. Additionally, quantum superposition is only half the battle. Quantum entanglement is the other thing that quantum computers use to skip the line in terms of their algorithmic speed. If you want to learn more about quantum entanglement, stay tuned because I'll have a video coming out on that soon. Additionally, if you're interested in quantum hardware, I'll be making videos on that too. Until next time, I've been Lucas, this has been Lucas's Lab, and thanks for watching.